So coming back to our assumption testing, um, kind of reviewing where we're at now, having gone through the process of actually checking those assumptions in the scatterplot. Um, the first one is that, yes, we've confirmed that our association is linear, so it meets that assumption. Yep, we've confirmed that there's no substantial outliers or gaps in our data. Yes, we know by the process of sampling, by obtaining this data in the first place, that the um, observations are independent. And this one we didn't actually check, but in the interest of saving time, because we can't cover everything in every week, it's the exact same process that we've been through a number of times before in checking that both of our variables are normally distributed, doing that through the graphs and also through the numeric summaries and the Shapiro-Wilk test. So normally you would do that. We're not going to just for the purposes of saving time now, but it's a matter of do as I say, not as I do in this particular instance. So assuming that all of our assumptions are met as they are now, then we can go on to talk about our correlation. So the correlation coefficient formula, if you were actually having to calculate it by hand, um, is written on the right hand side there. And there's a number of different elements of this formula. It probably looks quite overwhelming for those of you that aren't particularly um, friendly towards maths. And the important thing for you to know here is that I'm actually not going to expect you to work through this formula or produce an answer using this formula at all in this particular unit. What I want you to understand is generally the gist of what this formula is doing. And I'll talk to you about that in a second, but rest assured, you don't actually need to know how to work through it yourself. But what this formula is doing, the concept of a correlation, remember, is looking at the co-occurrence of scores on two different variables. So do higher scores on one variable tend to go with higher scores on the other variable is a positive correlation. Do higher scores on one variable tend to go with lower scores on the other variable is a negative correlation. Is there some kind of pattern or kind of co-occurrence relationship between scores on these two different variables? And that's exactly what this formula is doing. So if we think of, of X representing our first variable, say our independent variable, if we think of Y as representing our second variable, say our dependent variable, all this is doing is, relative, is calculating the difference for each individual score, the difference between that score and the average score for X, and then that score and the average score for Y, and then summing that up across all of our individual scores, and then dividing by the standard deviation. So it's conceptually what it's doing is calculating the relative concordance, the co-occurrence, the relationship between scores on these two variables relative to each variable's respective mean for each of our individual observations, for each observation for our data set. And the fact that the denominator of this formula is the standard deviation, so the standard deviation of X and the standard deviation of Y, is how we end up with a standardized effect size measure, which is what our correlation coefficient actually is. So it's just the same concept as when we were talking about Cohen's D a few weeks ago, that if we're looking at any kind of expression of difference in the case of Cohen's D or concordance correlation in the case of this one here, if we're dividing by a standard deviation, that means that the number that we end up with is expressed in standard deviation units. And that's how you get a standardized effect size measure as opposed to an unstandardized effect size measure. Um, and the standardized nature of that is how we can say, okay, underneath 0.3 is small, between 0.3 and 0.5 is medium or moderate and above 0.5 is large. It's the standardized nature of us that allows us to have those um, standards, pardon the pun, um, in the actual interpretation of those numbers themselves. Keep in mind, if you end up, say, Googling what a correlation coefficient formula is, just because it's such an interesting thing to do, right? Why wouldn't you not do that? There are different ways of expressing, of mathematically expressing this formula. So different formulas um, will achieve the same result. They're just different mathematical ways of expressing it. So you might, if you do end up Googling it, you might see a slightly different expression to what's here. That's okay. Even if you use a slightly different formula, you still get the same answer as long as it's calculating a Pearson's correlation. Um, every statistical uh, test statistic has degrees of freedom and the degrees of freedom are calculated differently depending on what statistical test it is we're talking about. For a correlation, the degrees of freedom are the sample size, big N is your sample size, minus two. So in this instance, our sample size is 24. 24 minus two gives us 22 degrees of freedom. So reminder, you don't actually need to remember that formula. You don't need to actually put numbers into the formula and work it out. You're very welcome to if you'd like to do that. And that's a good way of learning um, if you do want to do that. But I'm absolutely not expecting you to do that. You're not going to be assessed on doing that. We're not even going to do it ourselves in the lectures. 
Um, we just don't have time and it's not important enough, in my opinion, for you guys to, to do that. So the more important thing is understanding conceptually what the correlation is representing, how it actually works, um, and then understanding how to do it in Stutter and how to interpret the output in Stutter, which is what we're going to do now. So now that we have our research question, we have our hypothesis, we understand the variables that are involved in this particular um, hypothesis, our two variables. We've checked that our assumptions are met in order for a correlation to be appropriate. And so now what we can do is actually go on to run the correlation itself. Um, and that's what we're going to do. So if you're going to do the, it in the menu, in or in the menu, then you go to the statistics menu, down to summaries, tables, and tests, across to summary and descriptive statistics, and then down to pairwise correlations. There's a few different correlation options in Stata's menu. You can see just above pairwise, there's also correlations and covariances, but that gives you a slightly more limited output. Um, it gives you the same correlation coefficient, but it's a more limited output. So that's why I'm going with the pairwise correlations option there. And the appropriate or the, the corresponding syntax for that is PWCOR, as you'll see in the next, um, the next slide. So pairwise correlations, you then want to put any of the variables that are involved in this correlation. Remember that a correlation, the fact that it's a pairwise correlation means there's only two variables involved. Every correlation is an association between only two variables, has to be two variables. You can put multiple variables in this list of variables here if you want to, and what you get is just multiple pairwise correlations. So if I listed three variables in this variables box here, I would get a correlation between variable one and two, a correlation between variable two and three, and a correlation between variable one and three. So every pairwise correlation is only a correlation between two variables. Um, and I've ticked a couple of options here. I've ticked print the number of observations for each entry, just because I think it's good to have it to do that. And just the second one, print the significance level, which is the p-value that corresponds to the individual correlation coefficient. And this is the corresponding syntax. So PWCOR, pairwise correlation, and then variable, and then other variable. Does not matter what order you list the variables in. And then um, I've got a couple of options after that. So PWCOR is the command name that produces our correlation matrix. You can add as many variables as you want into it. As I said, it's gonna produce every possible pairwise correlation. And then the sig and the obs after the comma there, sig stands for significance, that gives us the p-value that goes along with the correlation. Obs stands for observations, and that gives us the sample size. So what you can see here, the correlation matrix has, in this case, we've got two variables. So we have two columns in our correlation matrix and two rows. Uh, each variable is listed in a column and also in a row, and then you kind of match up the variable that's in the column with the variable that's in the row to work out what the correlation is between. So the two boxes that are highlighted there, the correlations of one is just a correlation with each variable and itself, which is a perfect correlation, which is not very useful or helpful for, to us. So we always ignore the correlations that are on the diagonal because they're always the correlation between a variable and itself. The one that's actually interesting to us is this one here, which is the correlation between the Ebola search volume and then the voter intention index. And you can see that we have three numbers in each set here, the correlation coefficient, the p-value, and the number of observations. So let's talk about those in a bit more detail. So the first number here, the very first row in each kind of cluster of numbers here, is the correlation coefficient. This is represented by R, and this is the thing that tells us how strong the relationship is and also what the direction of the relationship is between these two variables. So remember, if this variable is a positive number, that means there's a positive correlation. If it's a negative number, it means it's a negative correlation. Here we have a correlation of 0.5, which is just on the cusp between a moderate and a strong positive correlation. The second number is our p-value, and this is the statistical significance of our correlation. And we interpret this the exact same way as we did back with when we were talking about t-tests before, that our p-value is statistically significant if it is less than 0 0.05. So here our p-value is 0 0.011, and that means that it is a statistically significant correlation um, because it is less than 0 0.05. So 0 0.01 is less than 0 0.05. 
So that means that the correlation of 0.5 is a significant correlation. And then the third number that we've got here is the number of observations in the correlation. So the very third number is the sample size here, the number of observations that this correlation was performed at, which is 24 observations, a sample size of 24. So conclusion here, before we get to our proper conclusion, we have our p-value is less than 0.05, so that means it's a statistically significant correlation. Our R is a positive number, which means it's a positive correlation. And our correlation coefficient is 0.51, so we can conclude that it's a moderate to a strong correlation. If you remember those cutoffs, 0.5 was just on the cutoff for, from a moderate to a strong correlation. The fact that this is 0.51 doesn't mean that it's magically strong as opposed to 0.49 where it would be magically uh, moderate. So that's why I'm saying here that it's a moderate to strong correlation. When you're making a proper conclusion, so a more informative or helpful conclusion, um, there's a couple of things that you need to make sure that you include. If it's a statistically significant result, you need to say that it's statistically significant. You need to make sure that you say what the direction is, so whether it's a positive or a negative correlation. You also want to make sure that you actually mention the size of the correlation and also some interpretation about whether that's a weak or a moderate or a strong correlation. And also some interpretation about what it actually means for the variables that you've performed the correlation on. And what I mean by that is rather than just saying there was a positive correlation full stop, can you phrase that or reframe that in the actual terminology of the variables that you're measuring, of the constructs or the ideas or the things that you're trying to represent? So in this instance, we could say that there's a significant positive, moderate to strong correlation between voter intention and Ebola searches. And we would quote the degrees of freedom there in parentheses after the R. We would quote the correlation coefficient 0.51 and the p-value of 0.012. And then my next sentence, which is that sort of interpretation sentence, I could say something like on days where with more Google searches for Ebola, voting intentions were significantly more oriented towards Republican versus Democrat candidates. And you can see that's a really different thing to saying there was a positive correlation between Ebola searches and voter intention index. It's a really different thing. and It's a much more meaningful statement to make. So I'm saying that higher scores on the Ebola search correspond to higher scores on the voter intention index. But what that actually means is that when there were more Google searches for Ebola, higher scores on the Ebola Google index variable, Voting intentions were significantly more oriented towards Republican candidates, which means higher scores on the voter intention index. I'm interpreting or putting meaning into the fact that there is a positive correlation between these two variables.